Thank you, Mick Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and say a few words, a few words, um, on second reading of this bill. Um, and I was glad to hear the minister speak, and I will address most of my comments to the forestry and aquaculture provisions um, in the bill as proposed. Congratulations to the Progressive Conservatives for bringing this forward. I mean, it's a good bill. It's a, it's a bill that, as we've heard many times, first came in under a previous Conservative government. But I do think it's worth noting <laughs> that it came in in the context of a minority government. And so it was gen genuinely a bill that came in, I think, with the cooperation of all parties in this legislature. And I was pleased to see the minister say, although I know that this falls directly under the jurisdiction of the Minister of the Environment, I was pleased to hear the Minister of Natural Resources you know, refer to the fact that he wanted to hear what the other members thought in terms of substantive comments on the bill or suggestions for the bill. Um, because I think that that is the spirit in which this bill came into being and hopefully in, with which it will continue to be relevant. Um, I think, you know, we do need all hands on deck uh, with this legislation. Uh, I think we do need cooperation in this House. And I think we do need also, to the Minister of Natural Resources point, cooperation within this province. We know that some of the provisions of this bill are going to impact some of our traditional industries, um, particularly around resource extraction, and that that you know, will continue to be a challenge in the way that that has been a challenge for Nova Scotia you know, as we transition uh, into a cleaner future. And so that's certainly uh, not lost on us. Um, but I will say that I... I do experience a little bit of cognitive dissonance having come out of the last day of the last session um, hearing the now government, then opposition rail against what I would argue are biodiversity targets that are absolutely required to meet the kind of twin crises of biodiversity and climate change, biodiversity loss and climate change, to then... <laughs> in this first session as government bring in what I do think, as I said, is a good piece of legislation, but, but, but we will be forgiven <laughs> for being vigilant because I think as has been raised in this debate, um, you know, <coughs> those of us who have been here for a little while have not always um, seen the Progressive Conservative Party as champions of the environment. There is a record. There is a commitment, but but I think that the track record is <laughs> is a little spotty, <laughs> and so you know we are doing our job. Um, we're doing our job here to ensure that this bill can progress in the way that it was originally introduced, which is with the agreement of all parties. Which I would argue recognizes that science actually does change. I mean, we've seen science change. <laughs> just in the course of this pandemic, in terms of how we understand it and how things move. We're not talking about health, we're talking about environment, but it's not different. <laughs> I see an, a, an acknowledgement from the minister. Um, but, but with those few comments, I would turn specifically to the Leahy report, and I would, I would, I mean, I take the minister's comments, but I would echo uh, the comments of the member uh, for, for Timberley Prospect, and I would say that I really think that 2023 is too long to wait. So we're pleased to hear that, that there are boots on the ground. I think that's great. I know there's progress being made. And as I said, disrupting traditional industries, which disrupts communities, which disrupts families, you know, we're not, we're not casting that aside. We're not eliding that reality. And yet, you know, we are genuinely in a climate crisis. And because that good work has been done, and because it's been in the department for so long, um, we think that that implementation needs to be faster. Um, and, and if that implementation, if the challenges of that implementation need to be mitigated um, by 
you know, job creation or community work in one way or another. We know there are some already funds set up for that purpose, but if more needs to be done, you will find support for that on the side of the House. But, but our, at least I can speak for our caucus, but, but I would say that that implementation needs to happen faster. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we are concerned with clear cutting. And so we would renew the call that we have made for some time, which is regardless of when that report will be fully implemented, we need an immediate moratorium on clear cutting on Crown lands in the meantime. We have some questions, and we've talked about this in, a context, in the context of another bill on the order paper around aquaculture and the provisions on aquaculture in the bill. It's it's vague, so, 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 so the government is bringing in targets, but, but these targets, as we read them, and you know, we'll hear more about this hopefully in the debate, these targets feel, feel vague, particularly, particularly for, for those folks across the province who are concerned about open net pen fish farming um, and, and its impact on coastal communities and on the environment. And, um, you know, like Leahy, before Leahy, we had Doel Leahy <laughs> uh, in the aquaculture context, and you know the key, many key recommendations from that report were never implemented. And and this piece of legislation, this conversation, this would be a great place to put those, mm -hmm. um, but we don't see those in here. And so so that's a challenge again that we see a gap that we see in our initial read of this. Um, and again, if we want to be forward-looking, if we're looking to the future, which is how this, this bill has been presented, um, you know, let's see some provisions around closed containment fish farming or transitioning the existing open net fish, fish pen fish farms, which, you know, I think it's arguable if there's a social license for those. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. That's work to be done. But, but, but if there isn't, which is our sense, <laughs> then let's talk about how we transition those out of the water and we keep those people employed and we keep that industry going. So I think there's opportunity for all of that. And again, I think that this, this uh, government has really, you know, in, in the course of the election, what we, we heard from many coastal communities is that they had faith actually in the, in the PC party that there would be action in this area, particularly around open net penfish farming. And, and I think people are still waiting. So this would be a place that that action uh, could be taken. And last, I want to talk a little bit about energy. So we're glad to see a renewable energy target back in this legislation. And in general, you know, I will say we are glad to see targets in this legislation. One of our big criticisms of the previous version of this bill was that those targets were left to regulation. And while we heard the arguments about why that was, um, we joined the voices of many who came to law amendments and canvassed our offices in the opinion that those targets should be in legislation. So we have some differences on the targets, which my colleague from Dartmouth North spoke of and which I'm sure we'll continue to debate. But we're glad the targets are there. Um, they could be, in renewable energy, they could be more ambitious. So um, strong targets are a challenge, but, but they also will help with the clean jobs transition that we need, right? And so we know that a report commissioned by the Ecology Action Center in 2018 said that with a goal of 90% renewable energy by 2030, so if we set that goal and we reach that goal, which we believe we ought to be doing, we could create 3,100 jobs per year for the next 12 years. That's, that's, I think, at the heart of some of the, ch you know, uh, underneath some of the arguments or the disagreements we have are those jobs, right? Like, who is this going to impact? And, and what are the challenges going to be on the communities? And so, so I think, you know, this like goes back to getting to yes, like mediation training I did a million years ago, right? It's like, what are the real issues? What are, what are we really talking about here? If we all really agree that there's a climate crisis, um, then let's agree to do everything we can. Let's agree to do everything we can to meet it. And let's 
call the challenges in the way for what they are, right? They're, they might not be a disagreement on the target. They might be a disagreement on how those targets impact the communities we represent. And if that's the challenge, let's talk about that challenge. Because talking about that challenge is a great conversation to have. Because that conversation is about how we rebuild our economy in a different way, in a way that meets the needs of the future. And I think that's the opportunity in this bill, and it's almost there, but not quite. <laughs> and so, you know, the same would carry through to community-owned power. That's something we've talked about a lot. Um, you know, Nova Scotia Power is a little bit the elephant in the room in all of these conversations that we have, because they're kind of ours and they're not ours. Um, but, but, you know, I think we do need to strengthen the possibility of community-owned power. The target for municipalities is, is vague. It's not quite connected to energy in a really clear way. And we've heard from many municipalities um, through the last few years who have been held back from doing the energy transition work that they want to do because they find the policies restrictive, there's red tape, and there's a lack of investment, quite frankly, provincially. Um, and so I think that's another area of improvement that we could see in this bill. On energy efficiency particularly, I think we need stronger midterm targets. And I want to say that, you know, we talked we spoke this morning in question period, or maybe it was yesterday, about offshore drilling and do we know what our resource is and we do, do we not know what our resource is. And I want to take this opportunity in the context of this bill to remind the House that the International Energy Agency has said that in order for the world to hit net zero by 2050, which I think we're all agreeing we need to do. Uh, zero carbon ready goals need to be the norm by 2030 and that we really can't take more fossil fuels out of the ground. That our focus needs to be as much as possible on leaving them where they are and leaving those hydrocarbons where they are and knowing that that is a challenge. Um, our energies, our focus, whether it's on energy or the economy or job creation specifically need to be focused forward on how are we going to get energy in the future? What kind of world are we building for our children? So the phase out of coal in the bill is good, but we need to think about looking at that around other fossil fuels as well. Uh, we're at the, on the eve of COP26 and we know that a huge piece of the conversation there, a cornerstone of the conversation, is going to be how quickly can we get off fossil fuels. I want to be having that conversation in this legislature as well. Um, there's, there's nothing, um, yeah, so I think, you know, don't listen to me, listen to the International Energy Agency, right? They say net zero calls for new, no new oil and gas exploration. And, and to the point of like, are, is what we're doing political? Is it partisan? Um, I mean, we're trying to work together on this frontier, I would say. But again, putting a dollar value on an imagined offshore resource creates political pressure to take it out of the ground. And I don't think we need that political pressure. I don't think any of us need it. I think what we need to, be do, is, to do is to be focused forward and to take that money and that, ec that energy and the, the expertise of the public service that would be brought to bear on looking at a project like that and put it somewhere else. Help us figure out how to get all of our buildings to net zero. Help us figure out how to green the grid. Help us figure out how to do all those things that are so much more important than putting a dollar value on an imagined resource in the ground. Maybe a real resource. I don't know. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I don't see any value in putting a number on it at this time. Um, and I would like to see something about that in this bill. There isn't anything in the bill that addresses winding down offshore oil and gas exploration or re uh, orienting, redirecting fossil fuel subsidies towards sustainable development. And I'll note that some countries have announced that they're shutting down new exploration entirely and have a date. So Denmark, largest producer of oil and gas in the EU in 2020, cancelled their last round of licensing and are committed to winding up all extraction by 2050. I mean, they're an active producer and they're done. And their GHG emissions reduction target is 70% below 1990 by 2030. Um, 
We heard some talk about biomass in the recent days in the chamber. Um, biomass uh, releases more car carbon than coal. People might be interested to know. And so I know that there's a, biomass is a contentious subject, but I really hope that we don't see, bi see biomass come in the back door under the name of green energy, because I don't think that's an accepted fact. <laughs> I think some people might think it is. I think uh, we don't, based on the science, which can be debated, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a conversation I think we want to have. Um, and again, it's not here. So, so I hope we have it somewhere uh, before any decisions are made in that area. Um, and this is an ambitious act. We've heard how ambitious it is. Um, but again, Quebec, right here in Nova Scotia, right here in Canada, also announced a ban on fossil fuel extraction. Mm -hmm. So there's not just precedence in the world. Uh, there's precedence right here in Canada, and it's one that I think we can follow. Um, and we can always do more. You know, I, I, uh, I know, uh, actually I don't know. I suspect that it is difficult to constantly be criticized <laughs> when you're trying to do really good work and you're representing departments that are trying to do really good work. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that you will take this and, and all of, of, of my remarks anyway, but, but I would say those of my, me and my colleagues, uh, in the spirit in which it's intended, mm -hmm. which is that we can always do better. Um, and we can, I really do believe that we can do better uh, the more information and input we have. So I offer those remarks in that spirit. I really do look forward to hearing uh, from folks at Law Amendments and to having further conversations. Thank you.